All right, so in this last video on the chain rule, we're going to look at a few more examples. And um, <clears throat> at the end, we're going to give an alternative form of the chain rule uh, that's useful in certain contexts. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's start with this one. Pac-Men is a moving company specializing in safely transporting arcade game cabinets. <clears throat> the yearly profit is given by this profit function. Uh, P of X equals 2.2 times the square root of X to the 7 thirds plus 90 and then minus 3.4 X minus 200. This is measured in hundreds of dollars when X moves are completed. We want to find the marginal profit when 3,299 moves are completed. And then we're going to interpret that answer. And it says we can round to four decimal places if necessary. <clears throat> okay, so... Marginal profit, first of all, is, remember, the derivative of your profit function. So in order to answer this question, we need P prime of X. Now, you can see where the chain rule is going to come into play, because here I have a composite function, the square root of a more uh, complex function down here instead of just an X. But the other parts of this function are not part of a composite function, so we can differentiate some of these other terms more easily. So <clears throat> how do we go about doing this? It is helpful to rewrite this. Uh, let's actually just start with P of X. We're going to rewrite it as 2.2 times X to the 7 thirds plus 90 to the 1 half power minus 3.4 uh, X minus 200. Um, this just helps me to use the power rule a little bit more effectively. And remember, the way that we're using the chain rule here is by that generalized power rule. So this derivative will take this one half, bring it down, we'll subtract one from the exponent, and then we'll multiply by the derivative of the stuff in parentheses here. So <clears throat> now we're ready for P prime. The one half comes down. One half times 2.2 is just 1.1. Um, and then this will stay the same, x to the 7 thirds plus 90. And then I have a negative one-half here. One-half minus one is negative one-half. This will be multiplied <clears throat> by the derivative of the function inside parentheses here. 90 goes to zero when we take its derivative because it's a constant. Here, the seven-thirds will come down from the power rule. Subtract one from seven-thirds. That's four-thirds. So this is the derivative of this first part of our function. And then 3.4x 3 uh, is just going to have a derivative of 3.4, negative 3.4 technically, because there's a minus there. Negative 200 is a constant that goes to zero when I take its derivative. So this is my derivative. I can simplify this by you know, multiplying this 1.1 to that 7 point, or 7 thirds x, four, x to the 4 thirds power and what have you. <clears throat> I'm not going to worry too much about that right now. Because my goal here is to uh, find the marginal profit, which we use this function for, specifically when 3,299 moves are completed. So that's going to amount to plugging uh, 3,299 uh, into this derivative. That's 1.1 times, let's move this factor out to the front. Typically, we would see these terms come before these things in parentheses. So I'm just going to say times 7 thirds. X, I'm plugging in a, a 3299. So this becomes uh, 3299 to the 4 thirds power <clears throat> times 3299 to the 7 thirds power plus 90 to the negative 1 half power minus 3.4. Obviously, this is this is something you, something you want to use a calculator for. This is not something that you're going to try and do by hand by any means at all. So this goes right into a calculator. Um, and what we end up getting out of this is approximately, this should be an equals here, approximately uh, 6.503. It said around to four decimal places, but the... Uh, the fourth decimal place actually would have been a zero in, in the rounding, so we, we tend to not write a zero at the very end. <clears throat> um, with this, we have to interpret what we just found. So we have marginal profit. Remember, this is the rate of change in your profit when this many moves are happening. And remember, this is measured in hundreds of dollars. So if I want to convert it to dollars, I have to multiply it by 100, 
which would move this decimal point two spots over. Um, so what that amounts to is uh, if I move that decimal point over, it's $650.30 is what that would become. And that represents the um, rate at which our profit is increasing per move at this level. So I can say something like this. One uh, Pac-Man, that's the name of the company, <clears throat> makes... Thirty-two hundred ninety-nine uh, moves. The rate of increase in profit is approximately uh, six hundred fifty dollars and thirty cents per move. Now, <clears throat> when we talked about marginal analysis earlier in this chapter, we said that another way of interpreting this quantity is the approximate profit for the very next move. So alternatively, I'm going to say alternatively, an explanation we could give is that the uh, 300 or sorry, 3,300th move because notice that would be the next move after 3,299 moves. The 3,300th move will generate approximately $650.30 in profit. That's how we can interpret this. Okay? <clears throat> so... That's, a, uh, that's a, a good example. Again, we keep coming back to marginal analysis because it's sort of the way that we interpret derivatives of the types of functions we see in these business and economics applications. Let's take a look at an example that we haven't really dealt with since the beginning of this course, um, compound interest. We can make sense of compound interest uh, in, in, or, or make sense of derivatives in a problem like this. Um, it says we take we make a deposit of fifty thousand dollars <throat> in an account that earns three point four percent annual interest, and we want to find the the rate at which our account balance is increasing after nine years if interest is compounded, and then we have monthly here and continuously here. So different compounding rates um, for A and B, but otherwise all the information is the same. So to do this, we have to recall how we find compound interest. Uh, our account, A of T, where T is time measured in years. Remember, that's equal to our principal, which is 50,000 times 1 plus. Now, this here is the rate as a decimal, our interest rate, which is 0 0.034. That's 3.4% as a decimal divided by n, and if you remember, n <clears throat> is the number of times interest is compounded in one year. So this would become uh, 12. That's what a monthly compounding rate would be, 12 times per year. Then up here, we raise this to the power of n t. So again, n is 12, and t is the number of years. So that t had to show up somewhere in order for this thing to be a function of t, and that's where we see it. Um, we can, you know, simplify the inside just a little bit. 50,000 times 1 is the same thing as 12 over 12 to get that common denominator. So adding the numerators would give me 12.034 over 12. And again, to the 12t. I'm not going to worry about, you know, getting a decimal for this or simplifying it. I, I'm just going to leave it in this form. That's totally fine. But now if we look at what the problem is asking for, <clears throat> we want the rate at which your account balance is increasing after nine years. So it's not the amount in the account, which is what this function tells me. It's the rate at which it's increasing. And remember, rates of change, rates of increase or decrease are what derivatives tell us. So in order to answer that question, I would need to find the derivative of this function. Well, really, what type of a function is this? This is an exponential function. I have a constant times some constant raised to a power 
But that power in itself is a function of t. It's not just t by itself. It's 12t. So that means the chain rule would be appropriate here. Specifically, <clears throat> we want to use that generalized um, exponential rule. So what that says is that to take the derivative of this, I have my constant out here, which is going nowhere, times the uh, derivative of this exponent, which would just be 12, times the original exponential function, 12.034 over 12 times 12t. That was our general uh, <coughs> general exponential rule. And then there's one additional thing that comes out of this, the natural log of the base. So the natural log of 12.034 over 12. That gets multiplied in there as well. Okay, so uh, now we want the, specifically, we want the rate at which our account is increasing after nine years. So that gives me something to plug in for t. Remember, that's number of years. A prime of nine. So I would be plugging that in here. 50,000 times 12 times 12.034 over 12 to the 12 times 9 power times the natural log of 12.034 over 12. <clears throat> okay? As, as the previous example, we, we want to just go straight to a calculator with this. Don't worry about trying to simplify things by hand. Just figure out what that comes out to. This is approximately 2,304 dollars and 31 cents. And remember, the way that we interpret this, the units that we would measure this in, because it's a derivative, is dollars, because that's the uh, units for our account balance, per year, because that's how we measure time. So once nine years have passed in this account, um, we would expect the next year, the 10th year, to, uh, to earn about $2,304.31 um, in our just from interest, okay? All right, the next problem is the same information, but we're talking about continuously compounded interest this time. <clears throat> so if you recall, for continuously compounded interest, we use uh, the principal, 50,000, times e to the rt. r, remember, is my rate, 0 0.034, and there's where the t shows up. <clears throat> so we do the same thing. We want a derivative. This one has got a simpler looking derivative because this is the exponential function e to a power instead of just some general base to a power. And when that happens, we don't have this additional natural log thing that comes out of it. So to take its derivative, the 50,000 stays put. I take the derivative of my exponent, which is just that constant 0 0.034. And then I have the same exponential function here, 0.034t, and no additional natural log that needs to show up here. Okay, now I do exactly what I did before. Plug 9 in to see what's going on there. 50,000 times 0.034, e to the 0.034 times 9. And this is approximately, again, go into a calculator, figure this one out. $2,308.57. So notice the amount of interest I accumulate when uh, interest is compounded continuously is more than monthly, which we would have expected, but very, very little more. Like it's it's only about $4 and, and some change more than what we got at a monthly compounding rate. Um, so that's that's consistent with what we saw in the first week of the class where we compared continuously compounded interest to some other uh, um, intervals of compounding. And uh, the improvement got pretty small in the long term, even though it was there. Okay? <clears throat> okay. So to, to finish out this section, we're going to introduce an alternative form of the chain rule. And what it is... Is it's a it's a form that uses that other notation for derivatives that we have seen. This is called Leibniz notation, named after 
uh, a mathematician who's one of the people responsible for creating calculus in the first place. Um, <clears throat> but this is just another form of the chain rule that we already know. Remember, the chain rule that we already know is if we take the derivative of f of g of x like this, it's equal to f prime of g of x times g prime of x. However, if we take the function g of x, the one that's on the inside, and we assign it the variable u, then another thing I could write here in place of that is f prime of u, right? Because that's what g of x is. It's defined to be equal to u. f prime of u times g prime of x. But Leibniz notation takes those variables and it gives them, uh, it shows both the dependent and independent variable in that notation. Notice in this version of the chain rule, we're going to also call f of u, which I'm seeing here, it's derivative actually, we're going to call that y. So that f prime would be dy du, that's the variable that's showing up now, times g prime, remember we're calling g u, so I can call that du, and then its variable is x, dx. So this is what we're seeing right here, okay? <clears throat> and this form of the chain rule is actually a tad simpler looking because of that variable that we assign there, that u that's in there. Sorry, just taking a sip of coffee there. Um, one way of remembering this version of the chain rule too is if we think of these things as fractions, which they are technically not, but if we just pretend like they are for a second, these du's would be canceling each other out, and I'd have that dy dx that I'm already seeing right there. So there's kind of a there's kind of an intuition behind that notation. I just want to do a couple of examples where we use this notation to find an indicated derivative. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to say that z is equal to 17x plus 4x to the negative third power. And x is equal to 7 natural log of y plus e to the y power. And what we want to find is dz dy. Notice there is no y in this function. The z is not defined in terms of y. It's defined in terms of x. But each of these x's can alternatively be defined in terms of y because we have this thing over here. So one thing I could do is take this expression and substitute it in for all of the x's here which would make this thing look much more complicated. Then I could try applying the chain rule from there. However, this alternative form of the chain rule right here helps to simplify that a little bit. So it's asking me to find dz dy. According to the alternative form of the chain rule, it's not, I'm not using y, u, and x here, but remember those are just labels. We can use different labels and still adapt this form of the chain rule with those different labels. I can think of this as dz dx times dx dy. Remember, the key thing is that these things should cancel out, giving me the dz dy that I started with. So what is dz dx? Well, by definition, it's the derivative of this function z with respect to x. So I'm literally taking the derivative of this with respect to that variable x right there. That would be 17. This, then I'd use the power rule here. Negative 3 comes down, multiplies, gives me negative 12x, then subtract 1 from my exponent, so I get negative 4. Then I want dx dy. <clears throat> okay, so dx dy is the derivative of this function x here with respect to y. So 7 times the derivative of the natural log function. Remember, the derivative of the natural log of y would be 1 over y. But I'm multiplying the 7 here, so that becomes 7 over y. And then this plus e to the y, remember, that's its own derivative, plus e to the y. So this is the derivative of this. The only issue is that it says dz dy, implying that my independent variable should be a y. I do have y's in there, but I also have these additional variables x. If I just wrote this down, it, there's no indication that x and y are related to each other, even though we know that they are. So it's a good idea to go one additional step, and anywhere we see this x, let's substitute this expression that x is equal to, because that way we'll only be dealing in y's. 17 minus 12, um, and then in here I'm going to put 7 
natural log of y plus e to the y to the negative 4 power. So you see that? I just put that expression in for the x right there. There's nothing else that needs a substitution, so everything else will look the same. Okay. Now by this point, you've seen that some of the chain rule problems that we have done can get kind of nasty, kind of uh, messy. This was relatively simple, and it's because of the notation that we're using and the way that we set up our function. Let's try one more example before we wrap things up. Uh, here, given u is equal to x to the sixth um, over log of x, that's log base 10, and y equals 5 minus u to the 16th all to the 14th power, we want dy dx. So notice y is given as a function of u, and u is given as a function of x. So using that alternative form of the chain rule, we want to think of this as dy du times du dx. Remember, check to see, do these cancel? They do. That would leave me with dy dx, which is what I have here. <clears throat> so let's find those derivatives. What is dy du? So here's y. If I want to differentiate with respect to u, I'm using the chain rule in just with this one function. So specifically, I'm using the generalized power rule. 14 comes down. I have 5 minus u to the 16th power. Subtract 1 from the exponent. That's 13. Multiply by the derivative of the function on the inside. Negative 16u to the negative 17th power. That's going to be the power rule applied here. Okay, next up, um, <clears throat> we have du dx. Here's u up here. I want to take its derivative. That requires the quotient rule. So uh, we have times the derivative of that function, which is going to look like uh, log of x times the derivative of that guy up there. The derivative of that numerator would be 12x to the fifth. So I get 12x to the fifth times log of x minus the top function times the derivative of the bottom function. Well, the top function is 2x to the sixth. The derivative of the function on the bottom, remember, would be 1 over natural log of 10 times x. And then we put that whole thing over our denominator squared like this. Okay, I'm going to go one final step. And I will go ahead and uh, plug in uh, this expression for u, where I see it down here. So that's equal to 14 times 5 minus, I'm going to use square brackets there actually, 5 minus uh, 2x to the 6th over log of x. And that's to the 16th power. And then that whole thing is to the 13th power. And then here we're going to have negative 16. And then same thing, 2x to the 6th over log of x, uh, but this time to the negative 17th power. Aside from that, this stuff all has x's already, which is what we want our independent variable to be. So I will keep those x's in there, but I might just multiply this thing up into the numerator just to make it a little bit simpler looking. 12x to the 5th log of x minus 2. Uh, now look at it here. I can do some cancellation. This x to the 6th, I can cancel one of those x's with this x down here. So actually, I'm going to write this as 2x to the fifth over the natural log of 10. That's a little bit simpler. All over log of x squared. Okay? As I'm sure you've noticed, throughout this chapter, but especially in this specific section, <clears throat> the derivatives that we're getting can be really, really long, messy expressions like this. But hopefully you're seeing just the mechanics of how we're getting these things. Even if they look super complicated, um, you should be kind of focusing on, well, what were the steps that took me to this? Okay, that's going to wrap it up for this section.